Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our service today, particularly if you're visiting with us. Uh, we do have a cup of tea afterwards through the hall behind me here. Uh, so please do, if you're able, stay behind uh, for a cuppa uh, with us. If you picked up a bulletin sheet, there's quite a lot of bits and pieces on there. Um, on the front, just to highlight Wednesday, it's the third Wednesday of the month. So we've got our congregational prayer meeting. So we'll, that'll be here in Hilton. We'll be joined by the Tain folk uh, for that one on Wednesday night. Overleaf. So thank you to everyone who helped with the stall yesterday and baking for the stall, contributing to the stall, buying from the stall. Uh, we made £600. We actually ran out of baking. We could have sold more if we'd had it. Um, so I was quite disappointed at that because there's usually some leftovers that I can take home. So that was good. Good result. So thank you to all who helped with that. Songs of Praise this afternoon as part of the Fisher Folk Festival. So that's uh, along the road in Patterson Stores, 2.30 p.m., uh, Andrew will be speaking there, and remember this evening, uh, the gospel concert in the Seabird Hall at 7 p.m. Uh, there's also that remembrance service at Chapel Hill, that's at the same similar time, so there is a clash there. Uh, curry night, just read that for yourselves. Rod and Emma are cooking at Oswestry Junior Camp, so in order to raise funds for that, to help uh, with the budget for cooking, etc., or whatever. Um, they're holding a curry night. So there is a sign-up sheet So through here, or, yeah, there's a sign-up sheet through here, just to give an idea uh, of numbers coming along, and that will be just a donation uh, on the night. Again, just to highlight the camp support, if you've got kids going to camp, let us know, we'll help out with the finances, Teen communion, and the invitation services, again, that last one on there, just to draw that to your attention so that you're thinking about it and so that you're praying about it. We'll get invitation cards drawn up but there's two dates now. It's been the dates have been nailed. 11th and 18th June, we'll have uh, services and a sermon that's geared to towards newcomers. So please uh, do be praying about that. We com commend it to your prayers. Well, we're here to worship God. We're going to sing first of all from Psalm 66. You'll find that on page 83 in your blue psalm books. The blue psalm books, page 83. We're singing Psalm 66 and verses 1 to 7 of that psalm. Psalm 66 and page 83. Shout loud with joy to God. All earth your code is raised. Sing loud the honor of his name and glorious make his praise. These words that invite us to lift up our voices to God. So let us do that. Let's stand if you're able and sing praise to God. seated. 
I'm going to pray now. The children will close our eyes and we'll bow our heads and we'll talk to God in prayer. Lord God of heaven and earth, you are the one who rules with might and with power as we've just been singing. And whether we accept this or not, we are all under your authority. We're all under your rule. We, we rely on you. We rely on you for the breath in our lungs and the beating of our hearts and every other need that we have as well. So help us, Lord, to realize our need of you. Help us to acknowledge it and help us to bow the knee before you and to worship you as our creator God. By nature, we don't want to do that. We, we rebel against you. We don't want to be under the rule of anyone. And we imagine, Lord, that we know best and that, that God wants to curtail us, maybe even to spoil things for us. But Lord, help us to realize that that's so far from the truth. That what Jesus said is, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. So help us, Lord, to understand that your desire for us is for good. And help us to draw near to you today. Enable us, Lord, to to bow the knee before you and to seek to live under your authority. Be with each one of us, young and old today. We thank you for our visitors with us. We pray that you would bless them. We pray that you'd be with our own people, Lord, particularly those who have specific needs. Be with us now and help us, we pray. We ask all of this with the cleansing and the forgiveness of our sin. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, children, when you come down to the front, I've got some stuff here I need to show you today. So if you come, that will be good.
Sing again now, this time from a Psalm 19. Sing Psalms 19. It's on page 23. Page 23 in your psalm books. Sing Psalms 19 and at verse 9, singing to the end of the psalm. I'm on page 23, God's radiant commands shed light on what we see. The fear of God is pure and lasts eternally. The standards of the Lord express his perfect truth and righteousness. Psalm 19, from verse 9 to the end of the psalm, we'll stand if you're able. We're going to read God's Word now from the New Testament and the Gospel according to Matthew in the last chapter, chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. If you've got a church Bible, it's on page 1,000, on, well, page 1,000. We'll start, at, take up the reading at the beginning of the chapter. We're going to be focusing on the words at the end, the last few verses, what's known as the Great Commission. And let's read the whole of the chapter together. Matthew chapter 28, reading from the beginning. <clears throat> After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. 
The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say, His disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. Some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Amen. May God bless to us that reading of his holy and inspired word. Let's just bow our heads now in a word of prayer. (coughs) Lord, what a wonderful promise we have there from the lips of Jesus. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. But we realize that this, this promise accompanied an instruction, a command. And that we can only be assured, Lord, that he is with us as we go in obedience to him as we live our lives according to his calling so help us to be such people help us to be like the psalmist who said to do thy will i take delight help us lord to be seeking your will for our lives to be praying that you would lead us and that you would guide us and you would help us to know lord the path we ought to be going on and yet there are some things that are so plain that we We don't need guidance on. There are instructions like this, Lord, where you tell us to be going and to be making disciples. So we thank you, Lord, that we have your word. We thank you that we have the Bible to instruct us, to teach us, that you haven't left us in the dark. And as we meet you this morning, we meet to learn from it, to hear from you. Help us to always ensure that the Bible is at the center of what we do as a church that it guides us, that it directs us, because this is your inspired word for us. This is where God speaks to us today. So we ask, God, that you would bless the preaching of it here in Tain and throughout our nation and to the ends of the earth today. We want to pray uh, for the service this afternoon as part of the Fisher Folk Festival, the Songs of Praise event, and, and the gospel concert this evening, Lord. We pray that these would be means of blessing to people. We pray for any folk who come along and who hear your word spoken and preached this afternoon, Lord, who may not be in the habit of going to church. We ask, Lord, that you would bless that word and and use it, Lord, to change hearts and lives. We thank you that these uh, events are part of the Fisher Folk Festival, and we ask, Lord, that you would bless them. We think about our own invitation services that we have planned for next month, Lord. We pray that you, O Lord, would be in this. We pray that you would burden us to pray about these, to pray for specific people, maybe people that are already on our minds or maybe people that as we pray, you you lay on our hearts. And Lord, that we would, that we would cover this event in prayer. And that we would commit it to you. And that we would ask, Lord, that you would be pleased to 
to lead us, Lord, to people whom you have your hand on, people whose hearts you've already moved who are longing for something, who are seeking truth. So we ask, Lord, that you would help us with that and with all the work of the congregation, Lord. We pray for the lunch tomorrow. We'll be back on after a couple of public holidays. We ask that you would bless every encounter there with, with people, and that we would be able not just to, sh to speak truth, but to show them the love of Jesus uh, in action. Bless our people, Lord, with their varying needs today. We remember those who grieve, Lord. Uh, we think of uh, Mary Bald in, at the Tain End, who, uh, whose father was laid to rest yesterday. Lord, we ask your blessing on her and on her mum and her brother and her sister. Surround that family, Lord, with your comfort at this time. And all who are grieving, Lord, all who are hurting, because they have lost someone who was loved by them. We pray that you would uphold. We pray that you would bring your presence, Lord, and your comfort into these difficult situations. We pray for people all over the world, Lord, who are in difficulty, caught up in war, in famine, in drought, whatever it might be. We ask, Lord, that you would help them and help the organizations that seek to alleviate suffering and help us to support these organizations if we are in a position uh, to do so. So bless us today, Lord. Bless the youngsters with us those who are out in Sunday school and crash, those who are still in with us in church, Lord. We love to hear youngsters among us. And we ask that your hand would be upon them, Lord, for good. So be with each one of us, young and old, as you see our need. Lead us in all that we seek to do today. We ask this in Jesus. Amen. Uh, let's sing once more before we turn back to that passage to study it. We're going to sing uh, now from... Psalm 145 on page 444 in your psalm books, page 444. Psalm 145, the second version, the long meter version of that psalm. We're going to sing from the beginning down to the verse marked 7. O Lord, thou art my God and King, thee will I magnify and praise. I will thee bless and gladly sing unto thy holy name always. Psalm 145, page 444, we're singing verses 1 to 7.
And seeking the Lord's help, can we turn in our Bibles to the passage that we read together in Matthew chapter 28? We're looking at the last few verses. We can read again at verse um, 18. Matthew 28, verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Go and make disciples. Why do we evangelize? Why do we seek to reach out to others and invite them to come in and join us? We do so because that is the instruction that Jesus left us. He is addressing his apostles here, but his instruction wasn't just for them. It was for all of us. If it was just for 11 men who would be dead in a few decades, why the need for the promise? Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is for you and this is for me. The church of Jesus Christ must always be advancing into new territories, reaching out to new people with the aim not just of introducing them to Jesus Christ, but making them followers of Jesus. Our planned invitation services, they are just a stepping stone. Yes, we want people to come to church, but not to fill a pew, but to come to know Jesus Christ, to come to follow him and serve him and be his disciples. You know, if this instruction had only been for these 11 apostles, the church of Jesus Christ would have fizzled out long ago. But Jesus calls us to continue what they started. As a church, we are to be about mission and not just maintenance. Our duty is to go out, not just look after those who are already in. Yes, that is a duty. But we need to reach out to those who are not yet in church, as well as look after those who are. You know that in almost every appearance of Jesus after his resurrection, in almost every one, he said to the people that he met, go and tell, go and tell. And so we are to do that because of Christ's instruction, yes, because a church that does not evangelize will die, but also because we have good news and there are people out there who desperately need to hear it. We can't go keeping it to ourselves. So I want to look today at these closing verses of Matthew 28, what's known as the Great Commission. I want to do so under three headings. First of all, the authority. Secondly, the agenda. And thirdly, the assurance. The authority, the agenda, and the assurance. Just a few words to set the scene, first of all. Matthew 28, we read it. You've seen Jesus has not long risen from the dead. He's met uh, already several times with his disciples. Matthew doesn't recount all the meetings. And, and, but he's shortly going to be leaving them to return to heaven. And so he gives them his instructions for them before he's gone. Verse 16 tells us there was 11 apostles that met with Jesus. Remember, there was originally 12. Judas had betrayed him. And after that, racked with guilt, he took his own life. So now there's just 11 left. Now, some people suggest that because this was an outdoor meeting, they met Jesus on a mountain, that there will be others present in addition to the 11. That's quite plausible, quite possible. They always followed the apostles. They followed Jesus wherever he went. But the Bible doesn't tell us that, so we can't be certain whether there were others there as well as the 11 or not. But here on this mountain, Jesus gives them his 
vision for the expansion of his church. And he tells them about his part in it, and he tells them about their part in it. His part and our part. So let's look at these together. First of all, then, we're considering the authority. The authority. I was recently at an event where um, I was told to go and take this seat. And the seat seemed kind of a wee bit overly prominent for, for me to, to take. And I was a wee bit worried whether the person, t- it was actually a child uh, in a school, whether the child had the authority to tell me I'd go and take this seat. And, you know, we, we can be like that quite often in situations in life. We wonder whether people have the required authority to tell us what to do or th- where to go. And there were plenty of people who questioned Jesus' authority. And we're seeing the doubters even here. So before Jesus said in verse 18, all authority in heaven and earth has give, been given to me, we read in verse 17 that while there were those who worshipped him, there were some who doubted. There were some who doubted. Now, I, <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I, I, I read that and I wonder, why does Matthew bother to include that? At this stage, just as he's wrapping up his gospel, he's, he's written this account of Jesus' life and ministry, I'm sure, with the, the hope and the intention that people will be persuaded that he is the Messiah, that he's the Son of God. So why, when you're just putting it all together, does he tell us that folk had doubts? Well, I'll tell you why, why he says that. He says it's because it's true. And, and Matthew and the other writers, they don't cover up stuff that might not aid their argument. They're reporting truth. They're telling us what happened. Now, if Matthew's, if Matthew's argument for Jesus being the Messiah and Jesus having the authority of the Son of God, if that, if that, was, if that had holes in it, He might have been tempted to leave this bit out. But Matthew's case was rock solid. Jesus had proved his authority again and again. So he can tell us that, yes, there were folk who doubted. Jerome, who was a theologian and and historian uh, in the fourth century, he says this about this fact that Matthew mentions, the doubters. Jerome said, their doubting increases our faith Because we realize that these people didn't just gullibly accept the resurrected Jesus. They examined him. They questioned him. They touched him before they came to be persuaded. So there were doubters. And we need to remember that Jesus is addressing the doubters as well as those who were convinced when he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now, plenty of people had noticed the authority of Jesus prior to this, his authority on earth. And if you read through Matthew's gospel, chapter 7, 8, 9, you'll see a repeated emphasis on that, on his authority. Chapter 7, verse 29, we read, the people were amazed because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. So they'd noticed his authority in his teaching. Go to the next chapter, Matthew chapter 8. They see his authority over diseases. He heals people in the early verses. They see his authority over nature. He then goes and he stills the storm, calms the sea. They see his authority over demons, because still in Matthew 8, he then goes and he, he casts out demons. And then carry on into the next chapter, Matthew chapter 9 when the man, the the paralytic, is brought to him on a mat and let down through the roof, you see his authority to forgive sin. Because he says to that man, your sins are forgiven you. So people had been, Jesus had been demonstrating his authority on earth. And people had been noticing that. But now he says, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. What does that mean? We know that phrase. You've heard that phrase many, many times. What difference does that make to your life today? Well, it does this, surely. The fact that Jesus has all authority on earth 
means that anything he tells you to do, you can do it. And the fact that he has authority in heaven means when you do what he tells you to do, you can be assured that he will bless it. He has the authority to bless it. And then when we come to the detail of the great commission, when he says, go and make disciples, notice how that verse begins. Verse 19, it's therefore go. Therefore go and make disciples. So the therefore ties it back to what he's just been saying about his authority. Because Jesus has this authority, we can do what he asks us. And we can be assured that he will help us to do it. So that's the first thing today, the authority. The authority. I want to move secondly and talk about the agenda. I want to highlight three things. Three things on the agenda Jesus gave to them in verse 19. Make disciples, baptize them, and teach them. Why do I miss out the first part? Go. When he says, go. Well, I missed that out. Well, I'm not missing it out, but I'm not putting it on the agenda. Because it's not actually a command. If it were more accurately be translated, it would say, as you are going. As you are going, do this and this and this. As you're going. In other words, what he's telling us to do should be part and partial of our everyday lives as you go about your business be making disciples ensuring they get baptized and teaching them teaching them jesus is telling us that we should be we should be intentional about this not just waiting to see if an opportunity arises but seeking to create opportunities, looking for opportunities to share Jesus with those we come into contact with every day of our lives. And that's a lot of people. We should be intentional. Remember the parable Jesus told about the sower? He said, a sower went out to sow seed. That's intentional. He knew what he was doing. He planned what he was doing. And we should be intentional in our evangelism, and sharing Jesus with others. As you are going, then, be doing this and this and this, these three things on the agenda. So the first of them is make disciples. Make disciples of all nations. What is a disciple? It's more than just a believer. It's, even, it's more than, than even a follower. The, probably the closest I can think of is is an apprentice, an apprentice, one who learns from another whilst following them. We are called to make disciples for Jesus. Now, that would be clearer to a first century audience than it would be to us, because nowadays we enroll people in a school. In the first century, you enrolled someone with a teacher. You enrolled them with a teacher. So number one on Christ's agenda for us is that we get people to enroll with him, to be pupils of Christ and to learn from him. And let me tell you this, and if you're a mature Christian or if you've been a Christian for a while, you know this already. We're talking about lifelong learning. Lifelong learning. You'll never know it all while you're in this world. You're always going to be learning more about Jesus, more about yourself, more about his love and his commitment for you. I remember meeting an, an older Christian, someone who'd been a Christian for a long time, and just general talk, just saying, how are you today? And she said, looking fairly glumly, every day is a school day. And then she broke into this gigantic smile, and she said, but graduation day is coming. Graduation is coming. I came for her. She's in glory now. 
But as she went through her life, even having been a Christian for decades, every day was a school day. Lifelong learning. We're disciples of Jesus. And that's what he wants us to make of others whom, whom we bring into church and who, by his Spirit, come to know him. We want them to be always learning, always following in his footsteps. You know, Jesus, he doesn't tell us to go seeking decisions, but seeking disciples. There was an outreach in Tain last summer. I was away at the time. And it was being reported that there were 42 decisions for Jesus. As far as I'm aware, there might not even be four of these who became disciples of Jesus. We need to be careful. It's not decisions he calls us to look for, but disciples. People who have an ongoing living relationship, learning from Jesus Christ. So, yes, we're encouraging people to come to church in an invitation service, but that is just the start. And that's why our invitations must be steeped in prayer before we make them, as we make them, after we make them as well. And Matthew says, make disciples of all nations. Now, that probably doesn't seem out of place to you, but it's a little odd in Matthew's gospel. Because Matthew was focused on the Jews. Matthew wrote his gospel for the Jews. And earlier, Matthew has told us, I think it's Matthew 11, when Jesus first sent out the 12, he said this. It's Matthew 10. He said this to his 12. Do not go among the Gentiles, that's the non-Jews, or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So when Jesus first sent out the 12, it was to the Jews and to the Jews only. But now that mission is to the whole world. Go and make disciples of all nations. So that's the first thing on the agenda, make disciples. The second thing on the agenda, baptize. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Baptism is a mark of belonging. It is a mark of identification with Christ and with his people. It's a public thing as well. Now, now is not the time to, to digress onto why we baptize infants and not just wait until they become older, till they come of age, and if they wish to profess uh, faith in Jesus themselves. The reason why we mostly see adults being baptized in the New Testament and not children is that this is the first generation of Christians. This is the first generation who are being baptized. We do see, we do read of and, and see some whose households, when they got saved, their household was baptized with them. But I, I don't have time to go into that discussion right now. Baptism brings people under the umbrella of the church. Now, when Jesus says here, go and make disciples, he's not telling you, you know, you go, you take someone to Hilton and baptize them there. You take someone along to Shandwick. It's the church that does it. It's the church that does it. Because we are bringing them under the umbrella of the church. But he's saying you encourage them to come to Christ. And you encourage them to be baptized. In the New Testament, every believer became part of the church. You won't find lone Christians in the New Testament. We need the support mechanism of the church. Your faith will not survive on its own. So baptism brings someone under the umbrella of the church. We're looking at the agenda, make disciples, baptize them, teach is the next one. Teaching them to, verse 20, obey everything I have commanded you. You know, nowadays, people don't want teaching. They don't want, in church at least, they don't want doctrine. They want experience. They don't want to learn something. They want to feel something. Now, don't get me wrong. I am all for feelings. But feelings alone will not sustain you. 
when the going gets tough. It's what you know and have learnt about God that will enable your faith to survive when it's under attack. It's that you've learnt that God doesn't love you any less when it all goes pear-shaped than he did when it was all going well. And as Christians, we need to be getting taught. We need to be studying the Bible for ourselves. We need to be coming to a place where it is being taught. And that's why the Bible is at the center of all we do. I hope you, I hope you notice that, that Andrew and I, we don't, and your other preachers, don't come up here and just tell you what we think about life events. You can see today we're going through this line by line, explaining, teaching you what God says to us the Bible and on a Sunday evening we probably delve a little deeper and on a Wednesday evening we go into it in more detail still because teaching is at the heart of discipleship it's at the heart of growing as Christians and while you can't go baptizing people right left and center you can go teaching people you can take somebody under your wing a younger christian and and nurture them and teach them read the bible with them pray with them and show them by the way you live your life what it is to be a disciple of jesus christ and this book this is our curriculum and it's the first ever curriculum for excellence and the only curriculum for excellence that really exists. Notice Jesus doesn't say, he doesn't just say teaching them. What does he actually say? Look at your Bibles, verse 20, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. The Bible is not just to be learned, it is to be lived. Teaching them to obey. James and his apostles says, do not be mere hearers only, but be doers of the word of God, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. So as you're going, here's your agenda from Jesus. Make disciples, baptize them, and teach them. That's the agenda. We've looked at the authority, we've looked at the agenda more briefly Thirdly, the assurance, the assurance. The closing words of the chapter. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Oh, what a wonderful promise this is from Jesus. As you go, he says, I'm going with you. I am going with you. That's what gives you any hope of success, any hope of progress. You do not go alone. You know, sometimes you just need to go before you'll get this sense, this assurance that he's with you. Remember we read at the start that some doubted, some doubted. Yet Jesus didn't say, you guys stay behind and you guys go. He said to them all, you go, you go. Charles Price a preacher and, and writer, he said this. He said, the best solution to doubt is obedience to God. Obedience to God. Just do what he's calling you to do. Sometimes it's in taking that step of faith that we get the assurance that he's been there with us all along. So these 11 apostles then, they went in obedience to Jesus. And you know they were transformed they were transformed in, in, in their obedience. Remember, they were, after he died, they were covering wrecks, hiding in an upper room, saying, are you sure you locked the door? They were terrified for fear that they too would suffer for their faith. And now they go, probably knowing fine that they are going to suffer for their faith. And yet they go in obedience to Jesus' command. And as we go, friends, as we go seeking to reach the lost for Jesus, 
we must absolutely do so in dependence on him. We will not achieve anything in our own strength, but we can do great things in his strength. This assurance, surely I am with you always. Literally translated, it is surely I am with you all the days. All the days to the very end of the age. So Jesus is saying to you today, he's saying I'm with you today. If you're living in obedience to me, I'm with you today. And I'll be with you tomorrow. And I'll be with you the day after that. And that's never going to change. It's never going to change to the very end of the age. So friends, let's be going. And as we go, with this great assurance, as we go seeking to bring people, not just to hear about Jesus, but to meet with Jesus, to come to trust and follow Jesus and to be his disciples. This is our calling, to make apprentices for Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord, your word challenges us often. And we pray, Lord, that when it does, we would bring that back to you and ask, Lord, that you would help us to do what you call us to do. And even as we come asking that you'd help us, we already know that you've promised that help. And you will go with us. And you will be with us. So help us to trust you, Lord. And to put that trust into action, we pray. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to finish singing in Psalm 139. On page 181, page 181, Psalm 139a, and we're going to sing three verses from verse 16 to verse 18, and on page 181, verse 16, and all the days that I should live, which you ordained for me, were written in your book, O Lord, before they came to be. Psalm 139, we're singing 16 to 18 to God's praise. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.